Hello, welcome. Today I'm going to be doing a video on occupation laws. Occupation laws got a pretty significant change when Bible Let Alone came out. The lower level ones like civilian oversight and local police force, they take way more resources than previously. They need more manpower, they need more guns, and they're not quite as effective at reducing resistance. This means if you just do what used to be the meta, which is just leave everything on civilian oversight, you're going to end up with massive amounts of resistance and you're going to be and it's going to end up being a bit of a resource drain. So the question is, what should we do now? What should we do when we're at peace? What should we do when we're at war? Now, obviously for actual garrisons, you should definitely just be using cavalry. It is really expensive to use light tanks. I mean, that's your other option. This is all you need, unless you're gonna do military police. If you're gonna get military police, then you should take um, proper heritage, makes adding cavalry free, and then go for a full 50 with, and then add your military police on. That is the most cost-effective way of using military police. And then, you know, there is the light tank design. I, I didn't intend on showing all of this as Luxembourg. You know, it's just Luxembourg has one extra occupation law as local autonomy because it's democratic. Germany is obviously not democratic, so I can't showcase this one. And it is a good one. I mean, 20% compliance gain is really nice. But anyways, I'll, I'll show you the alternative. The alternative to using cavalry is you go in here, you take the cheapest gun you can get, and then you just click save. 80% hardness, 2.4 IC. This has huge upfront costs, but long term, and I'm talking like three to four years, you will save IC. I did a whole other video on that actually prior to buy blood alone. Anyway, so I set up a very simple test. Let me just reload it. Well, actually, I set up two. I'm going to load the one at peace. I did another one while I was at war because it does change things quite significantly because you have a minus 10% resistance gain when you're at peace. Not only does that go away when you're at war, that minus 10% controller is at peace, you also get additional penalties from occupied and exile. So what I did was one run for two years with each compliance law from civilian oversight to martial law. And then I did harsh quotas. I mean, forced labor is useful for the resources, but I mean, they have the exact same stats other than what local factories and resources you get. So I didn't bother doing both. And then brutal oppression is literally only to get your resistance down to a more reasonable level at the exchange of compliance. Outside of that, you should never use it. And I am doing this with a full 50 with cavalry division. So what you can do is there's a handy little command, pause in hours. If you use this command, the game will automatically pause after the hours you put in. So I did that for a year, recorded the results after one year, and then I did it for a second year. And what this gives you is this Excel spreadsheet. I have the raw data where I've recorded the equipment costs to start up, manpower, the equipment in use and the losses after one year, the manpower in use and losses after one year, and then again after two years. And I've also recorded compliance, resistance, factories, and manpower. I did, I did a little NPV calculation. The first time I did this when I was at peace, I did not build anything. So we need something to discount these factories back to present day, because we all know factories now are worth more than factories later, especially for military factories, because, you know, getting that factory after two years versus having it now, that's two years worth of production you're losing out on. So anyways, we can use this information to make these nice little graphs. So we'll start with that piece. What should we do at peace? Well, you're going to spend a lot of IC if you're at civilian oversight. Because there is no resistance suppression on civilian oversight, your resistance builds up quite a bit while you're waiting for your compliance to come up. After one year, you're going to be sitting at about 27% and 27%. That is a lot of resistance. At two years, you're still sitting at 19% resistance, but now you have 46% compliance. This leads you to having significantly more factories than everyone else, but you've spent a significant amount of IC to get there. So starting out on civilian oversight might not be the best idea, even when you're at peace. Local police force, you still get a good amount of compliance growth, but you keep that resistance down. That's a 14% swing. Oh, and to get this number, what I did was I picked, where's Australia? Queensland. It's a medium-sized state. It has some victory points. It's near another state that has victory points, so it's going to get a little bit of resistance spread. I'm taking this as basically the average state when it comes to resistance and compliance. And something you'll notice is everyone starts at 10% resistance other than local police force and civilian oversight. Why? Because you can't go below 10% without compliance. 
which means harsh quotas will always be at 10%. Martial law and military governor will slowly gain compliance, though, not as quickly as everything else, so they'll eventually end up at 0%. Civilian oversight will theoretically eventually get to 0%, because every one compliance is worth 0.5 resistance. So if you're starting at 40, you'd need 80. So you will eventually get there, but it will take forever. Ever. And based on these results, and especially the number of factories with our net present value, I wouldn't hate being on secret police. It doesn't cost that much in IC. It doesn't cost that much in manpower. You can kind of just fire and forget. It's not going to maximize stuff. You do get an extra 5% local factories over all of the other occupation laws. I don't think there's any purpose in using military governor or martial law while you're at peace. Harsh quotas has an argument. It's going to cost you a lot of IC over time because you're never going to gain any compliance. You're just going to be stuck at 10% resistance, but you get so many factories from it. When you have the whole world annexed, most other law started about 370, secret police has 424, Harsh Quotas has 649. That is so many extra factories. So using Harsh Quotas in states that have really high factory counts and then something like local police force everywhere else is not a horrible idea. I also think it might make more sense to maybe use local police force for the first year and a bit so that you get some compliance and then switching to civilian oversight just because of how much I see you're going to lose in that first year because you've got no resistance suppression and you also have no compliance. You can actually see that for civilian oversight, once you start getting your compliance up, your manpower costs go down. Your IC costs stagnate. Why? Because, well, we've got three figures here. What's in the field plus your two years of losses. As time goes on, your required in the field drops such that you actually end up netting to zero compared to your losses for that year. But you lose so much in that first year while you're waiting for compliance that I think it would make much more sense to use local police force. While you get some compliance, maybe you know you switch when you hit 20-ish percent, and then from then on, you start using civilian oversight while you're at peace. It'll keep your upfront costs a little bit lower. It'll keep your losses a little bit lower while still allowing you to get the massive benefit from civilian oversight's compliance in the long run. Or harsh quotas if you just really need those factories. So that's a piece. For for war, definitely do not use civilian oversight. You will just die. Civilian oversight while at war starts at 63% resistance. That is so insanely high. At over 50%, you suffer 100% extra damage to garrisons on top of having a 50% garrison penetration chance. So this just means you lose so much stuff when you're over 50%. Harsh quotas gives you a lot of factories up front. And for this one, I'm not net present value these factories because I actually built military factories for the whole two years. So that's where this growth comes from. So Harsh Quotas has this massive advantage of it starts with 450 factories compared to everyone else starting around 250 and Secret Police starting at 285. And it can use those factories to grow more factories. But you're going to spend a lot on doing this. Upfront, not that big of a deal. But as the years go on, you're going to be spending more IC than everything other than civilian oversight. And same goes for manpower. Because you never gain compliance, you're going to be stuck at 23% resistance until the end of time. And harsh quotas also gives 50% damage to garrisons while requiring more garrisons. So it's it can be a massive boon to your economy if, let's say, you conquered a bunch of land and you have a bunch of useless guns that you've conquered, and you have, let's say, a puppet like Indonesia. If you've managed to puppet them and you can just steal their manpower for garrisons, then harsh quotas is going to get you so many factories. If you can't afford those costs because maybe you haven't capitulated countries, you haven't gotten tons of useless guns from the AI yet, and you don't have a puppet to get that manpower from, you should not be using this liberally. Maybe for like that one state that has most of your enemy's factories, but for everything else, I would suggest maybe secret police or even still local police force. I mean, your manpower costs over time on local police forces are not very high. Your IC costs are kind of high though. But if you're conquering stuff and you're stealing guns from them, it's not that big of a deal. If IC is your main concern, playing a country that has manpower but doesn't have that much in the way of factories, you should definitely be leaning towards martial law. It keeps your resistance low the entire time. It doesn't give you much in the way of factories because it doesn't give you much in the way of compliance, but it keeps those IC costs down really low because you have such low resistance. All in all, well at war, I think it's a question of do you have IC or do you have manpower for what's going to maximize your factory count? Because really what's going to maximize your factory count over time is going to be either local police force or secret police. And it's really a question of can you spend the extra IC or can you spend the extra manpower?
Now, of course, harsh quotas is probably a lot more powerful than you think, and it does give you a lot more factories than you probably thought it did. But over time, those manpower losses just keep going up. Oh, wait, I just noticed an error. Hold on. So I actually just noticed something. I forgot to update this graph to actually pull from the at war data rather than the at peace data. So this graph looks a little bit different now. Do the results change? No, actually it's still the same. Local police force is gonna cost you more IC, but less but less manpower in that first year. And secret police is gonna cost you less IC, but it's gonna cost you more manpower. But what we can see here is that they are trending towards each other. And that can also be seen here in the more raw data part. Their resistances are trending towards each other. Their compliance is deviating though. Here there's a 5% difference. Here there's an eight. So I fixed the graph and I was going to re-record this, but I don't actually think it changes anything. At the end of the day, martial law will keep your costs down, but you're not going to get much in the way of factories, which is great if you're conquering countries that don't have much in the way of factories anyways. You know, there, there are certain states in the game, like in France, where it's just, there's no factories here. I mean, does it matter if we're using anything other than martial law? That's very micro-intensive, but if martial law is going to keep your costs down over time and compliance doesn't spread like resistance, I don't see much of a point of using anything other than martial law in states that have no factories. But that's really micro-intensive. I wouldn't expect most people to do that. Anyways, I've uploaded this to Google Docs. Um, you can find a link in the description if you want to just take a deeper look at it. Overall, I'd just say stay away from civilian oversight. It gets you tons of factories. I will admit that, but it costs you so much IC. You can get all of those factories for harsh quotas at a fraction of the cost and getting them up front. While at war, I just don't see any reason using civilian oversight ever. Um, I would stick probably to either local police force or secret police, depending on whether or not you have spare IC or manpower. And then martial law can be used anywhere anywhere you don't have factories. There are tons of states where there are no factories and compliance means nothing. So you might as well just stick them on martial law if you're willing to do the extra micro. And then harsh quotas, the opposite can be true. If you have states that have a stupid amount of factories in it, it might just be worth it to get those factories at the beginning, using them the whole time rather than waiting for them to come online two years later. Anyways, thank you for watching and I will see you guys next time.